Referrals are the worst way to grow a B2B consulting business. And yet 90% of B2B consultants are completely dependent on that method, if you can even call it that. In today's video, I'm going to tell you about the hierarchy of client acquisition methods. And there's only six of them. I'm going to explain why three of them are only slightly better than referrals, why two of them are considerably better. And I'm going to share how one of our clients, Tony, a fractional CFO, who implemented one of the good methods, instantly doubled his revenue within only two months of working with us. And so today we will discuss these six methods. We'll look at the pros and cons from the perspective of a B2B consultant so that you can make an informed choice on how you will hit revenue predictability, a six-figure income, and be able to scale your consulting business. My name is Michael Bohanes. I work with B2B consultants to help them build client acquisition systems, and I've worked with over 150 consultants to help them do just that. And so I'm going to jump into Google Docs because it's much better to read at the same time while you're listening so that you can retain more information. But before we discuss these methods, we have to make sure that we have the following foundational elements in place because without those, it doesn't even make sense to get started ascending to the higher client acquisition methods. So you can make the lower levels work without these building blocks, but the higher you go, the more difficult it will get to sustain things and build a multi six or even seven figure business. And those foundations are, first of all, a strong offer that gets a predictable percentage of strangers to raise their hand and want to talk to you. And there's two sides to it. The first one is objectively what you sell to whom. You have to sell to one avatar in one niche. You solve one problem and you provide a specific solution to that problem. And then also the other side is how you communicate it. The communication side has three sides to it. We help you get a specific outcome in a specific amount of time. And ideally it contains some kind of risk reversal, money back guarantee, or at least a low risk entry offer to get the relationship started. Something like I call it a foot in the door offer, something low risk. Next foundation is operational scalability. There has to be at least conceptually the ability to fulfill with relatively minimal involvement from you, the founder, because otherwise you will soon hit the bottleneck that you have to constantly deliver to your clients and you will not be able to get more clients because if you sell your time, then of course you will not be able to scale that to seven figures. You have to create some kind of system where other people can deliver for you or where you have a mechanism like, for example, like in our case, we have the Alpha Lead Academy, which is a compendium of systems that people can just absorb, watch and implement in their own business. And that provides a certain level of scalability, right? We can do this asynchronously. I don't have to teach them one-to-one. -one. They can just do it based on the materials that we provide. So that is operational scalability. And then finally, high margins, you know, meaning as a solopreneur, you're not living hand to mouth. You're able to stack cash and work on the business. So ideally you would not be selling at an hourly rate. You'd be selling a kind of result, a goal, and that can be achieved in an asynchronous way, or at least with people who fulfill for you. So high margins, at least 50%, preferably something like 70%. Okay, now give yourself a score in each of these three areas and then think how you can improve that score. If right now you completely depend on yourself to deliver, then you have to figure out some kind of way to either teach somebody to deliver for you, outsource a bit easier chunks of your work, create some kind of a vehicle like a course and systems compendium, but you cannot start scaling and you cannot start applying client acquisition methods if you completely depend on yourself. Now, it's, it's a very different story if you, for example, now have nothing, you don't have any revenue and you just want to con do consulting on a day rate, you know, just to get some cash in and to then kind of develop skills that then will, able, then will allow you to scale. I still think that in that case, you can absolutely still follow this recipe and follow these six client acquisition methods, but they will be more and more effective and you can ascend higher the more these three things are checked. So strong offer, scalability, and high margins. Okay, now let's take a look at the big six methods of booking sales calls in ascending order of impact on the growth of your revenue and profit. Credit here goes to Alex Ramosi, who to my knowledge is the first one to spell this out as simple as uh, it sounds. So first of all is referral word of mouth uh, networking, then there's affiliates, then there's owned media, an email list, earned media, content, cold outreach, and then paid ads and webinar funnels. So that's the list. And the truth is that some of those are better than others as far as building a system is concerned. And we measure a system by the following four criteria. First of all, and the most important one, how much of a causal input-output relationship is there? Meaning, if we do more inputs, does it reliably and predictably result in consistent outputs, i.e., is it a system? Then, what's the length of the build, measure, learn cycle, i.e., how fast do we learn if something works or not? The shorter, the better. Also, how costly is a build, measure, learn cycle? How much does it cost to validate one hypothesis? 
And then how easily can we scale, i.e. do more of the same? Okay, so those are the criteria we evaluate these systems against. So the first method is referral word of mouth networking that can be organic or systematized. When I say systematized, I mean, it can either be in terms of your recurring organic outreach. So let's say you every day you contact 10 people, you ask them for a friendly referral, or it can also be incentivized, meaning you have, let's say, a landing page where you say, hey, anybody who refers a client to us is going to get 10% of revenue whatever that is, it is, it can be systematized. If it is incentivized, the line then gets a little bit blurred between this method and number two affiliates, which we'll cover in a moment. So the pros of referrals are, of course, that it's cheap in terms of dollars. It's a good place to start. I would absolutely recommend if you're starting out, you clearly should milk your network for what it's worth and get your first few clients, makes the most sense. And it's also very easy to close deals. If somebody comes uh, to you via referral, they tend to have, you know, 50% plus, sometimes even 80, 90% closing rates, because obviously there's a lot of trust already baked into it. And they probably would not be talking to you if they did not have that need. However, there's a lot of cons. And that's why I always say just don't depend on referrals, because there's just a lot of um, negatives to it. First of all, it can be very time consuming, as you can imagine, doing coffee chats and catch up with people is very, very time consuming, is also highly unpredictable. It also relies on the CEO and founder. Like if people tell you, oh, you should go to conferences and to events. Sure. I mean, it's better than sitting at home, but imagine if this is your client acquisition strategy, you're going to be going to conferences. It means that you always have to hit the road. You cannot like send a junior employee there. He's going to be, he or she is going to be way less effective than you. So it's just not good because it constantly relies on you. And there's no, even in the future, there's no perspective to outsource it ever. It also, and that's a really interesting one. It leads to limiting beliefs you start thinking that the world is a very small place. It's a scarcity mentality because you get into this rut of thinking, I can only get clients through people who already know me. And that is a small universe of people. So truly limiting beliefs. And you end up selling everything to everyone and not build specialized expertise. I absolutely know this for myself. In the first two years of my business's existence, I was, of course, selling everything to everyone. I was completely dependent on referrals and I was doing things as diverse as a newsletter for a small private equity fund to creating thought leadership books for SaaS companies to editing a textbook for two university professors. Like, sure, you can, it's all kind of content, you can say, but so vastly different that I was not building any specialized expertise in any area. Now, there are some people who proudly state that all of their business comes from referrals, and that's a great source of pride for them, as it should be because it obviously means that they are good at what they do, especially if they are if they are booked out. But unless this stream of referrals is so powerful that you're constantly booked out and you can effectively command any rates that you dictate, it's a very bad system to rely on. Okay, number two, affiliates. There are two types of affiliates. The, the first one is a classic online affiliates, which is people you would find at affiliate networks and who simply drive online traffic to your offer. That tends to simply not work in complex B2B, any kind of consulting offers, any kind of, let's say, fractional CXO offers, marketing agencies, coaches. It just doesn't work. It's not a standardized enough offer. It only works in relatively, you know, as I say, standardized lower ticket products like sub $1,000 info products, high margin physical products, such as supplements. And the second kind of affiliates is uh, paid for referral relationships with people who are adjacent to your industry. Classic example is if you're a fractional CFO, you get chummy with a few CPA firms so that they refer you to their customers who want strategic advice. So that I would classify as affiliates. These are people who bring you business, but they will, of course, always want to take a cut. And you can systematize that and make it somewhat predictable. You know, if you as a fractional CFO, you have your seeds planted in 100 CPA firms that can be relatively predictable that you will at some point, once the volume is high enough, you will probably get enough business from that. But it is also something that needs to be constantly nurtured and lubricated so that people don't forget about you. So let's look at the pros. Pros are it's relatively easy to close deals because once again, it's a little bit like a referral relationship. These people come to you and they will close at a pretty high rate as well. But there's also many cons. There's a very unclear input output ratio. It's not like in cold email or in ads where you just know, I'm just going to test a few angles and at some point I'm going to land on one. Here it's, you could be building these relationships for a long time and God knows how long it will take before the first deal comes through. You also lose a good chunk of the margin, right? Usually you will have a hard time finding these kind of affiliate relationships that charge less than 20%. 
And you're also, again, back to depending on third parties for your business, which is the worst, worst aspect to it. Even if it's just where the margin is low, but you're back to depending on third parties, it's really, really bad. You have no control. Good. Let's look at number three, owned media, email lists. This is when you're, for example, putting out lead magnets constantly and people subscribe to your PDF, white paper, and so on. And you then harvest those email addresses. You can then gradually email them and introduce your offers to them, try different angles. Hey, it's Easter, so it's 10% off, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Okay, so there are pros to it, of course. There's relatively low client acquisition cost because all you have to do is you know, put out lead magnets, collect email addresses, and then send them messages. It's relatively cheap, right? And it's also you gain independence from the powers that be. You don't depend on algorithms. This is your own email list of people who have voluntarily subscribed to your content. So that is great. It also builds a personal brand, which is extremely valuable. So I strongly recommend that. However, cons, it takes time to build. It's less predictable if you're just starting out and you want a client in the next, let's say, three months. You really need a client in the next three months. Owned media is a very bad idea. It just takes a lot of time. It's totally unpredictable. You have no, like this measure, build, learn cycle is just extremely slow. You don't know what will work. Also, you cannot be just too salesy on the emails. It's like if you sell in every single email and you're not extremely skilled at that. There are people who sell in every single email. I know that. And they are very, very skilled at copywriting. And they also have a, let's say, relatively kind of brazen, uh, very salesy persona. And people like that about them. In that case, you can do it. But for most people, it's just simply capped. You cannot in every single email hardcore sell something. Then you also need to feed the email acquisition machine. That means more complexity, meaning you have to constantly put out new lead magnets. You have to be on the pulse of your market. What kind of lead magnets do they want? And it can get quite exhausting because it's almost like a parallel business that you're setting up. Constantly need to pump out interesting contents that will be good enough so that people want to give you their email address for it. It's just a parallel business that you have to run on the side of your actual money business. So much more uh, complexity. And it's also hard to discern the tire kickers from really interested people, right? There's very few signals that you can glean from an owned email list that will tell you, oh, this person is actually a potential buyer versus this person who constantly opens my emails. It's just a tire kicker who just reads and never buys. Okay, so that's owned media, email list, pros and cons. And then there's earned media, i.e. content. Of course, I love content. I think it's great. That's why I'm doing this video, right? So it's also very fun. I really enjoy doing these videos because they clarify my own thinking. Like Since I've been doing in-depth, long-form YouTube videos, I feel like I've become much better at what I do because my thinking is clearer. I have a much clearer line of reasoning. Writing is uh, thinking in crystallized form. So it's very, very good, good for you. Also, very low client acquisition cost. Right? I just have to spend time creating these videos, which is a good activity, as I said. So it's extremely low CAC. It's also great because people who come to me via my content are also extremely likely to close. And the sales calls are just pure fun because they feel like they know me. So it's like they're talking to a friend and they just say, all right, I'm ready now. There's also a high overlap between this and your product. So a lot of the content that I put out on YouTube, I can use in my in my product, in how I serve my clients. As I said, you become a better thinker and you're building a personal brand, which is immensely valuable in the long run. The cons of content is that can take a long time to get going and to get clients from it. it can turn into a hamster wheel. You cannot detach from the founder. Right? You will constantly be, if you rely a lot on content, you will never be able to completely remove yourself and for half a year, get away from the business, you constantly have to pump out content. Right? If you do paid ads, for example, you can take time off, even cold email. And then you're a slave to the algorithms. Right? You don't know if you somehow fall foul of the powers that be, if you say something that is wrong and that you will get some kind of shadow ban slapped on you, something like this. It again puts you a little bit out of control. So. Content is great. I'm a huge fan of it. And building an audience and sharpening your message to it is one of the highest value activities that you can engage in. But one of the reasons I'm a little bit bearish on content is that in most cases, it's far less predictable than the higher level methods. And we'll get to them soon. I know that all the content systems people will now pounce at me and say that having super tight systems can make things very predictable. That's fine. I, I get it. And of course, they also have something to sell. But if you believe that, then I would ask you one simple question. If you believe that content is like the absolutely the thing that will guarantee you huge growth going forward, simple question here. Imagine you'd have to invest money into one of two businesses. 
One gets their clients mainly through content, the other one mainly through direct response paid ads. And otherwise, everything is identical between these two businesses. Which one would you invest in? Only knowing this, this is the only difference that you know about them. For me, it's clear the second business is far more robust because that business has figured out how to get a stranger with a problem to come on a sales call. And the first, the content-based one, is completely dependent on social networks and their algorithms. It's also extremely dependent on the founder, so it has a key person risk. The second business does not depend on the founder necessarily. If it's a simply where the pitch is good, where the offer is good, where the problem is one that they solve that is really key to the prospect, it doesn't depend on the founder. And the second, the ad-dependent one, knows that there will always be ways to pay for reach with a salesy method. Even if one social network, if Facebook failed, right? There will be other social networks. Advertising will become then easier on LinkedIn or on TikTok or God knows where else, YouTube, right? So if one platform fails or becomes too expensive, then we simply find another one and we reach people there. And most importantly, the ad dependent business has learned the crucial skill to create a direct response relationship and thus brings an immediacy between stimulus and revenue to the business. Content doesn't have that. Content usually has a much longer sales cycle between the first touch point and the sale can be months, if not sometimes years. In direct response, in cold email, yes, you don't have that relationship. You have a lower chance of closing, but you know that if you just pump out enough ads, you will get a certain predictable amount of people to come to you as clients. So I'm not saying you should always over-index on ads, by no means. You should ideally do both, right? Ads and content together are the best combination. But if I had to choose between one of them, I'd go for ads because of these reasons. Okay, let us now get into a bit of a hybrid form. This is like uh, the ugly bastard children of these uh, methods, and that is rented media. It's a combination of these methods. And I only mention this for completeness sake. I also don't give it its own number because there's all kinds of combination of acquisition methods. For example, the whole unholy business of appearing on other people's podcasts or leveraging other people's newsletters, right? And this is a combination of paid ads, content, referrals, and affiliates. You could also call it rented media. And the main reason I recommend against these hybrid forms is, and why I don't even dignify it with a proper number on this scale, is because of the noise they introduce. If they fail, which often they do, you have a very hard time figuring out why. For example, let's say you've gone on a podcast. The podcast host might have been grossly exaggerating his listenership numbers. Or half the newsletter's owner subscriber base are people in irrelevant geographies. It could have also been that that particular offer that you put in front of them, it simply didn't resonate. It also could be that you weren't in your best shape on the podcast and you forgot to mention a few crucial aspects of what you do. It could be that the newsletter owner only included one link in the text, but forgot to hyperlink the image you gave him and so on and so on. So there's like so many small things that are outside of your control that there's also very little repeatability. In all these rented media efforts, you cannot consciously optimize them. It's not like you can take one guy with a big newsletter and then run 20 variations of an ad on them. You know, maybe you can, but it would be, you know, quite costly and takes a long time to see whether it works, you know. So they, these things are just little experiments. They are Hail Marys that might work out. But if you want to be a serious player, then hoping for Hail Marys is a very poor strategy. Okay, and so now I'm drawing a line here because I want to draw a line under this last method because all the methods so far are based on the assumptions that people know you, that you're a known entity to the person making the purchase. Somehow they have to have some kind of validation from another person that this vendor, i.e. you, is good. You know, I'm giving my endorsement via referrals. That's that via affiliates. Let's say a CPA firm gives you a referral, right? Paid content is something that people have to know you before they sign up with you. So all of this is based on the fundamental premise that there needs to be familiarity between the seller and the buyer. And so with the next method, we are now crossing a very important line. It's like crossing the Rubicon because from here onward, we are booking calls with complete strangers. And this is the way to unlock true scale, especially predictable scale, because newsflash, unless you're Trump or King Charles, there are more people who don't know you than those who know you. So more business will come to you from those who don't know you. Also, you'll become a much nicer companion to those people who do know you because they know you don't need them as a potential client material or referral mules, right? It's like, it's always so 
Ugh, if you have somebody who reaches out to you every six months or so, hey, can we have a coffee chat? And I would love to know what you're up to. When you kind of clearly know that they just need some kind of a gig, they need a job and so on. If you can make strangers to respond to you, you will never have to do this undignified force networking. Okay, so with that said, let's get into the first method that is really, really good. And that is cold outbound, cold calling, cold DMing, cold emailing. It works, it's predictable, and it's reasonably scalable. It's an important part of our own business. We're on a trajectory to making 500K this year, and half of this comes from cold email. And I know people who have crossed a million dollars in yearly revenue, primarily with cold email as their source. The pros of this method is it's an actual system. So input versus output. If you send more emails, you will make more revenue. It's also relatively cheap, especially to start. You can tinker with it at very minimal cost until you make it work. You just need to email people. Right. It is also the first method where you learn to convert a complete stranger who doesn't know you. It is founder independent. Once you scale, right? I'm right now just things land in my calendar without much of my input because I have a system set up where other people are doing the cold emailing for me. It requires a little bit of ongoing input, maybe like one hour a week at this point for me. It's also good leverage. Once you find a proven niche offer combo, you can scale that relatively easily. Like in my world, there's about 100,000 people that I could sell to. And I just need to repeat the same message to them over and over and email 100 people every day. And I have a thousand days that I can send people emails to. And once I'm done with that, I start all over again because the first batches of people have completely forgotten about me and I can put a new offer in front of them. Okay, so what are the cons of cold outbound? First of all, most B2B consultants, it's not really a real con, but it's just people don't like it because it feels a little bit scuzzy. Right, because we associate cold emailing with some kind of scammy, oh, do you need an app for your business if you don't even have a business, right? That kind of stuff. But it's just a perception. If you write a good cold email, then people will even compliment you on it. I regularly get compliments on, on our method that is like, wow, this is a really cool and interesting way to get attention from someone. Second one is this can be a little bit difficult in some industries where the decision makers do not read their own email or DMs. But that's overrated in my experience. As I mentioned, this one consultant who invests three days to personalize a cold email, he's sending to you know CMOs of billion dollar businesses and they respond to him, right? Because these emails are are so good and so extremely personalized. It gets exponentially harder the bigger the company or deal sizes get, right? You have to put more brain work into developing these angles if you want to go after the really high value clients or big deal sizes. Whereas if you run ads, there very often it's just a matter of upfront investment of brain power where you just have a series of ads and other triggers that you can trigger automatically so that you get a sales call in. With cold email, it's very often you have to do customization for every single new prospect, right? So it gets harder the bigger the company or deal sizes get. And it's also less scalable than six, which is the which is paid ads. It, there is more operational friction. You know, you need to constantly get new leads. You have to clean them. You have to manage that list and so on. So there's more operational friction than in ads where you can just pump in new money and uh, more deals fall out on the other side. And so, as I said, the reason that this is such a great method is that you uncover what I call the holy grail, a niche offer angle combination that allows you to activate complete and total strangers. And the reason why so few people do this is because the process of uncovering this holy grail can be very painful and discouraging. You get rejected and ignored and you think like, oh, this won't work for my market, which is a typical way of, you know, snowflake thinking, oh, I'm so special. No, you're not. You just haven't taken the time to uncover what works. I mentioned that consultant who spends three days customizing his pitches to VPs of sales, CROs and CMOs, and the level he goes to to personalize his outreach is pretty insane. He even goes as far as interviewing their ideal clients, and he has a team of virtual assistants helping him in this endeavor. I also, as another example, I have helped one of my clients book sales calls with decamillionaire partners in private equity firms. Alex Ramosi also tells a story of how someone got through to him by just taking his long form videos, creating shorts out of them, and then sending him a bunch of those shorts for him to use, okay? This is how you get the attention of the ultra high net worth people. You just do stuff for them and you don't ask for anything in return. And then you do this a hundred times and one of them will take you up on the offer. But it of course takes work, it takes effort and it is fraught with rejection. So in very often, especially when you put in a lot of effort, which then goes unrewarded, that is the surest fire way how people will quit. Like nothing gets you to quit like unrewarded effort. And that is why it's so difficult to make work but it does work. And if cold outreach works on CMOs in multi-billion dollar firms, private equity firm partners, and Alex Ramosi, 
I bet you can make it work in your market as well. And that's how our client Tony got his first client for which he didn't depend on referrals. He just started cold DMing people on LinkedIn. And after doing it for two months, he signed his first non-referral client. Very straightforward. And I will be linking to the video where Tony tells his story in the show notes. And he doubled his monthly run rate within two months of working with us. Okay, now let's look at finally paid ads. Of course, the pros are by far, it's the most scalable method. It's a huge potential leverage. It's also better suited for experimentation and A-B testing than cold email. And it's also very fast. And another one that I uh, just remembered is that ads also gives you like a higher end perception, right? If you can afford to run ads, it's a little bit like that law firm with an expensive lobby. If you can afford that, it probably means that you're good at what you do because the lower level you are in the hierarchy of businesses, the less likely you are to do ads. So it's also a bit of a perception issue. And then cons, of course, they're expensive. They're expensive to pay your learning dues. I fully expect once I will be starting ads, it's going to happen sometimes later this year, that I'm going to be spending between twenty dollars and $30,000 in vain effectively, or effectively it's going to be learning fees before I crack the code. So it's going to take time and it's going to cost money. And so therefore it's not recommended for when you're just starting out. I would not be running ads. So in summary, this is these are the criteria. There has to be a clear input-output relationship to the system. The length of the learn cycle should be short. Cost of the learn cycle should be low. And uh, it should be easy to achieve scaling. So we look at these four methods, referrals and networking. The input-output relationship is meh. You know, yes, if you network more, you will get more. But it's a lot of like, potential wasted time. You're at some networking event. You realize no one there will be a potential client for you. And then you stuck at this event, you, you invested money and time into attending. The length of the learn cycle in referrals and networking is not terrible because you do get feedback from people, but still because very often you are networking with suboptimal people, you are wasting also a lot of time. So that lengthens your learn cycle. Cost of the learn cycle is okay, right? Because you're not spending any money on it. And ease of scaling is of course not there. Absolutely not because you'll soon run out of networks. You know, there will, there's only so many people that you know. Okay, let's look at affiliates. The input output relationship is also a little bit mad because yes, if you approach more, let's say if you're a fraction CFO, you approach more CPA firms, yes, you are more likely to get something, but you have to constantly keep that relationship warm. You have to remind yourself to them and all of that. And also have you, you don't get the immediacy of the feedback from the market is what you are selling is how you're positioning yourself is that right is what you're promising is it really attractive they might just say yeah sure there's like they'd be happy to talk to you it doesn't cost them anything so you don't get that immediacy of market feedback you cannot ask them directly for the business so the this also of course speaks to the learning cycle the length of the learn cycle for affiliates is of course very long to almost non-existent because you just don't have the ear to the market you don't know you only talk to the actual referrers rather than the people who will be making the buying decision so you don't really learn what resonates with your market it's very very limited of course it's uh, free you don't have much of a cost here because all you do is just put um, your hooks in the water and see who bites Ease of scaling is man because at least here, unlike in referrals and networking, you don't depend on people who you already know. So again, if you're a CA fractional CFO, you can approach many, many, many CPA firms and there's a certain level of scalability to it. All right, owned media, your own email list, input output relationship is not very clear. You have to constantly collect new email addresses. You try different angles, but it's gonna take a while to learn what works. Length of the learn cycle is very bad. You know, people can subscribe to your email newsletter and they can never convert. You could be running an email newsletter like for a year without having a single conversion. Cost of the learn cycle is of course cheap because it doesn't cost much to run your own newsletter. Ease of scaling, also a little bit meh. Yes, you could put more uh, fuel to the fire. If you put out more lead magnets, you will scale moderately, but again, it's not very good. Earned media, when you are doing content, the input output relationship is also not very clear. You know plenty of people who have on LinkedIn have a lot of engagement and no clients. I literally know one person who has had like between 100 and 300 likes per post hasn't gotten a single client. I know this person, I could exactly pinpoint who it is, but I won't. The length of the learn cycle in content is also very, very bad as we see here, because especially when you have not done any outreach, so you don't know what triggers people to react to a purchase exhortation, but you know what triggers people on content. You know that if you say, if you post some kind of vulnerable content, yeah, you're gonna get many likes. It can skew what you create content about. 
because you don't know what kind of content makes people buy. You know what content makes people like you and makes you popular. That can be evolved from very antithetical to what makes you money. So it, it's even like a, it's worse than a red X because you can actively be skewed towards putting out content that does not reward you in the way how you want to be rewarded. It's a false reward. Cost of the learn cycle is relatively low. Of course, you don't need to do, you don't need to spend much to run good content. And then ease of scaling. Yes, once you are, you're depending on the algorithms, which is why I don't recommend it very much, but of course it's better than nothing. Okay, now in cold outreach, the input output relationship is very clear. You send out more cold emails of what works, you will get clearly, there's a linear relationship, you'll get more results. The length of the learn cycle is very short. You can within a week or two, you know whether an angle has worked or not. The cost is also very low. Ease of scaling is there as well. Send out more email, you will get more uh, deals. And paid ads, finally, of course, very good input output relationship. This learn cycle is also very good. The cost is high. That is why we don't recommend it for beginners. And ease of scaling is massive, of course. That's why I gave it three check marks. So what is the upshot of all of this? Number one, get off the ground using referrals and networking. Find your first one to five clients there, but don't make yourself dependent on it. Then immediately start looking for the holy grail which is approaching strangers and getting a certain percentage of them to want to speak to you. Do that using cold email because it's cheap and predictable. Once you have found the holy grail, stack enough cash so that you can afford to start investing in ads, meaning hammer the cold emailing method until you make a lot of money. You can actually get to 100,000 a month. If you have the right vehicle, of course, the scalable vehicle, you can get to 100,000 a month run rate with that method alone. And then finally, do content in parallel and work to become better and better at it so that you can lower your overall client acquisition cost and you can build a personal brand, which is an insurance policy in the long run. There's nothing better than knowing how to trigger strangers to want to buy from you and having a personal brand so that people come to you because they trust you. And most importantly, never depend on third parties for your business referrals, affiliates, content that is subjected to the whims of the algorithms. All of those things keep you powerless.